Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today I want to give some more attention to this Atari 65XE that was given to me by Bernardo, aka the Byte Attic. I'm going to try to upgrade the RAM in this to 320 kilobytes, and I'm also going to replace the electrolytic capacitors, which are quite old, because the machine is quite old, as we all are. Yeah, so I'm not going to pay any attention to the outer appearance of this. I think that's good enough for another separate video. I am going to do some retro brighting and a lot of cleaning on this in the future, in some future video. Uh, as usual, I'm taking care of the electronics at first. So let's open this up. Should just be a couple of screws here. So that should be all the screws. I hope yeah, I can remove the top part altogether. And then we should also be able to take the keyboard out, which is connected by a flat flex ribbon, which is super brittle. So I'm going to be super careful. And then there's a couple of screws around the parameter of this circuit board that we also have to remove. Yeah, and there's definitely going to be a proper optical restoration video for this. As you can see, there's quite a lot of rust in here and dirt and things. First step is going to be replacing all the electrolytic capacitors, which in any case, in my opinion, my uh, educated or slightly, I don't know, self-taught opinion uh, can make a huge difference in these machines uh, of that era, of that age. Because, yeah, basically these machines are from the 80s and the capacitors, electrolytic capacitors, sometimes don't age well. Or in most cases, <laughs> they don't age well. So, uh, in my opinion, I know this is debatable because uh, some people claim that the old capacitors were better built than the modern ones. I don't really think so. I've seen quite a few capacitors fail over the years in my retro computer repairs. I think it's a good idea to replace them. So let's do that. I'm not going to go into great detail about the whole recapping process. Uh, just going to say that I'm going one capacitor at a time. I'm using Panasonic FC to replace the radial caps and I'm using Vishai uh, actual caps that I hopefully have enough of. There's a couple of different values. I think I'm going to list them in the video description in case you want to do your own recapping on one of these. There are, keep in mind that there are different versions of this board. Uh, this one has the footprints for some extra RAM, so it's basically the same circuit board that Atari used for the 130XE. Just going to desolder one by one, replace it with the same capacitance. Sometimes I'm going to use higher voltage ratings, but I don't recommend going much higher. Let's just do it. <laughs> Okay, I encountered a specialty about these boards. There's actually a lot of non-polarized capacitors in here. These are 4.7 microfarad. There's one in this position, one in this position, and one in this position. Uh, these are 4.7 microfarads, 35 volts, and I bought a bag of, uh, I think, Nichicon. Yeah, Nichicon replacement capacitors that have the same rating. Uh, should be fine to replace those. They are pretty, these are still commonly used in audio circuitry and things like that. So you probably are going to be able to find these. That's kind of a specialty. They don't have a polarity, obviously, as the name suggests. So they say NP on the side of the capacitor as well. Here's one that says NP in huge letters on the side there and uh, the usual 4.7 microfarads, 35 volts. I think I bought these way back, I can't really remember, I'm getting old, uh, when I planned on recapping this. So these are coming in handy now. 
<clears throat> and uh, I'm not too worried about these being a lot smaller than the original caps. Uh, that's usually what you get for modern capacitors. They are smaller than the original ones. I don't ha think these have any special abilities or magic. They are just bigger because back in the day, things were bigger. <laughs> I think that's all the electrolytic capacitors replaced with a good brand new ones. And yeah, especially on some of these ground planes, they are not that trivial to desolder. So you need a lot of heat and most of the heat is uh, wicked away by the ground planes, which are just layers of copper basically that are really heat conductive. So you need uh, some patience and I used some solar wick to clean up some of the joints there uh, before the pads were completely clear of any solder. Yeah, this is fully recapped now. Let's try if this still works. Yep, it seems to still work. Let's see if we get the ready prompt. Yes! Okay. That's promising. I'm going to let this uh, run for a while and see if anything gets hot because I uh, misplaced a cap there or something like that, but I have high hopes. It does appear to work absolutely fine. I haven't done any elaborate tests on this, but this is just a, a functional test, more or less uh, testing if any of the capacitors get gets warm, which they tend to do if you get them in the reverse polarity. So uh, I'm pretty confident that this is still a working Atari 65XE. Let's do some RAM upgrades. I initially planned to do this upgrade, which is uh, basically making the 65XE a 130XE with 128K of RAM. And as, as you've seen, they use the same circuit board, so it's not that difficult to do. The difficulty, however, is in uh, obtaining the memory controller chip for this mod. Uh, they, when this forum post was made in 2017, they seem to, uh, they seem to have been really readily available on eBay, and there was a seller that had quite a number of those. But unfortunately, that's no longer the case. So, uh, we have an unobtainium chip. You can replace this with a GAL, which is a programmable uh, logic chip, basically. However, I decided I want to do another mod that is posted a couple of posts below that by Jürgen. And uh, that uses a GAL chip and one of the 74 LS95 logic chips, which actually are, these 74 logic chips are the ones that are not as easily found anymore, unfortunately. The GALs are out of production, I think, and you need, of course, new RAM chips. But this mod is going to make my Atari 65 XE a 320 kilobytes machine. So that's pretty much a lot better. And it's also a mod that doesn't use the original Atari chip. So I went with this. Of course, I'm going to link the forum post in the video description in case you want to check that out yourself. Uh, all the stuff you need to make this mod are in there in English. Uh, the original poster of the 320 kilobyte mod has linked in a PDF that I've printed out here in German, unfortunately, with some more in-depth information, but actually you don't really need this. All the things you need to do this mod are in the forum post and you are going to be good to go if you just read that, if you want to do this yourself. Coincidentally, the Retro Channel, a very good retro computer channel from Australia, also did a video about this. So uh, in case you like the Australian accent better than uh, my German English accent, I, I recommend watching that video. 
he's doing exactly what I am going to do, basically. Maybe I'm going to be able to uh, translate some of the German description here and go into some more detail, but he's basically uh, doing the exact same mod and made an excellent video about that. It's an excellent channel, so I recommend checking that out as well. Anyway, so in order to do this mod, we are going to have to put in some sockets into these positions and we're going to have to put in some 100 nanofarad ceramic capacitors. And we are going to put a socket in this position and we are going to put a socket in this position. And remove these zero ohms resistors. Uh, obviously zero ohms means that they are jumpers basically. So we're going to remove these, put a socket in here put a couple of sockets in here, put a socket in here. This is where our 74 LS95 logic chip goes. This is where the GAL chip that this uses instead of the original memory controller chip from Atari uh, that this uses uh, goes. And this is where some of our 41256 RAM chips uh, go. These are relatively easy to find still on eBay. I found some new old stock ones, uh, the same ones actually that I used in my Commodore RAM expansion, expansion, RAM expansion, expansion, can I say that? I'm not sure. <laughs> Sounds a bit horrible, but uh, yeah, the same chips are going to go in here or the remaining eight chips that I have from that lot. I'm just going to do it and comment on what I'm doing basically. We're also going to have to wire some things up differently, but that's just a couple of solder joints, a couple of band lags on chips. And uh, we are going to put a switch in here that can uh, switch the RAM expansion off basically. So we have a stock Atari 65XE, which I think is pretty nice to have. You the, the switch is completely optional. Uh, most things should be compatible with the 320k RAM expansion that we are going to put in here. And there are easier ways to expand Ataris these days. There are like whole circuit boards. I'm going to link some options in the video description in case you want to check that out. There are some options where you just have to plug a uh, circuit board into your Atari and it's going to have one megabyte, I think, of RAM. There's not many programs actually making use of that much RAM. It's a bit of a different story with uh, 128K and even 320K. There's some demos and newly produced games that make use of that much memory. So I'm looking forward to trying some of that stuff out. If I get this to work at all, we're going to see. So first things first, uh, we are going to free all the positions where there's no chip on this board. Obviously, you can only do this on this version of the board, uh, the one with the with these uh, free footprints. Yeah, let's remove these jumpers, I guess, at first. And as I said, I'm going to have to remove the solder from all these pads. Oh, this mod actually works on the uh, 130XE as well, obviously. That has the exact same circuit board. But that has uh, the position where the gal goes in this mod already populated with the original memory controller chip that is used to switch the banks for the 128K. Here's the little jumper resistors, uh, zero ohm resistors. They only have one black ring. Actually, they are not used that often, so they are kind of a curiosity. I'm going to keep these in my parts bin, I think, for future use. Maybe we're going to see about that. So, I'm now just freeing up all the footprints here with my desoldering station. Of course, you need to free up the spots for the little capacitors as well. Some of the spots where the capacitors are going to go didn't come out. I think these are the ground connections. Yeah, probably they didn't come out quite right. So I'm just using some solder braid to free these up, hopefully. That looks better already. 
And in my experience, these Atari boards are pretty well made, so uh, it's not that easy to lift a pad, but you still want to be careful. So the only thing left is this little spot here. We have to free that up too. There we go. So we need a couple of different sockets. Uh, these are narrow pitch sockets dip dual inline package as these chips are called. Yeah, we need some 16 pin ones, 120 pin one and a 14 pin one, I believe. First of all, I want to populate all the little capacitors and I bought these 100 nanofarad 50 volts MLCC, which just means multi-layer ceramic capacitor, so uh, no big deal. <laughs> And these are marked with a 104 for 100 nanofarads. Just going to try and put them in there. Some kind of neat way. Of course, these footprints are made for actual capacitors. As you can tell by the other spots where they are already populated are populated with actual ones. Actual? Axial, axial. That's a really difficult word. Let's see. Just going to solder these in first. I kind of forgot that we also need to desolder this MMU memory management unit chip. That is uh, that needs some connections later on. So uh, it's a good idea to desolder this and put it in a socket and uh, we need to bend up some pins to make the connections later on. In order to desolder this, I'm going to add some fresh solder to all the pins, which will make it easier because there's fresh flux in there. And I want this chip out in one piece because we are going to put it back. I like to heat uh, these chips from the top side after desoldering the bottom side with some hot air because that makes things considerably easier. And usually we should be able to remove this without too much damage. There we go. And thankfully Atari left the legs on this uh, quite long, so we won't have any major issues inserting this into a socket after we straighten the pins a bit, which I am going to use a pair of small pliers and my uh, IC leg straightener tool for. And if you have an Atari 130XE and want to do that mod, uh, U34, where we had the jumpers in here, is going to be populated. You don't need that chip anymore. You can give it to a friend who wants to do a 128K upgrade on an Atari 65XE, for example, or sell it on eBay. So I'm going to put sockets in all the positions we just freed. And yeah, I'm using these turned pin sockets because I prefer these. It's a matter of taste, really. There's a lot of discussion going on if the leaf sockets are better or these turned pin sockets are better. I prefer these, especially in uh, projects where I want to insert chips like semi-permanently. I always feel like these make a more reliable contact. Uh, chips are not as easy to insert into these, so you have to have the legs really straight and be really careful to not bend any pins with these. Uh, the leaf sockets are easier that way, but in every other way I prefer these basically. So, yeah, as I said, matter of taste. No further discussion needed, I guess. These are also easier to get straight if you want a nice looking board than the leaf ones, which usually have really flimsy legs. These have very sturdy legs that exactly fit the pads. And of course you want to be sure to not build any solder bridges, which is pretty easy with a relatively narrow pitch like this. Yeah. 
And there we go. All the sockets are in. And it looks quite neat. I think I got all of them in straight in the correct orientation. You always want to make sure that the notch on the chip uh, matches with the notch on the socket and the notch on the silk screen, which I think I did correctly for all of them. At this point, I think it's a good idea to program the gal because we have to bend some pins on that. And I'm using my TL866 EEPROM programmer that can also handle all kinds of other programmable chips. I uh, highly recommend getting one of these. It's super versatile and an invaluable tool for retro tinkering. So I got the Mini Pro TL866 uh, software started up here and I already selected the IC I want to program. There's a huge list here. Uh, we are using 16V8 D gals, so I'm going to select that in the list. There's also other versions. I think uh, all the 16V8 versions in the correct package, which is like 20 pin dual inline package, uh, are going to work fine for this purpose. So we are selecting that. Um, we are going to open the file that we downloaded or that I downloaded from the Exos host forum post. It's still linked there. Should be in my downloads folder. That's a JDAC file. It's basically just a lookup table. These are just programmable logic chips, basically. So there's zeros and ones. It's a binary file. <laughs> then we're getting one of the chips and placing it in our programmer. Device. Program. And it should not make a difference if you encrypt it. You can also leave that out, of course. I'm probably going to uh, un uncheck this encryption. But it should not make a functional difference. So there we go. Program. Programming successful, verified. There's, it's very little data, of course, and it's pretty fast. So we should be good now. We have programmed our gal. Now we're going to have to do some wiring. Uh, namely, we have to connect pin one, which is this pin, the uh, top left pin, if you're looking at the socket in the correct orientation. Uh, so we are going to connect these on all these RAM chips together, pin one on all of these is going to be connected to our gal, which goes here. And then we're going to have to run a wire to the MMU and some other uh, connections on the gal. So yeah, let's just start by connecting all these pins together. And I'm going to run the wire on the back side of the board just because it looks neater and it makes it easier to replace the RAM chips. You could also bend up uh, pin one on all of these chips and connect the pins. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's easier and neater to do it from the back side of the board. So I'm going to go that route. And then I'm going to run the wire through this uh, hole that is existing. Uh, the poster of the forum post suggests drilling a hole around here into the board, but I don't think it's necessary to drill a hole because we can just use this pre-existing hole. It doesn't matter which kind of wire you use, really. You just don't want to uh, connect it to anything but the pins. <laughs> Pin one, I already, I marked it on the board with a little dot. So let's go from there. And I'm using this very thin wire and I'm just melting the insulation, I think. Where's my soldering iron? on the spots I want to solder. And it's a good idea to do this before you insert the chips, I think, because we don't want to expose the chips to any unnecessary heat. So here's what I ended up with, and I'm going to cut this at a reasonable length so we can run it through our hole there and connect it to the chip. I'm also going to check for shorts uh, with the other pins and for connection between the pins we wanted to connect together. <laughs> Which is obviously always a good idea. So we should have a connection between these, these, 
these, these, these, these, and these. And we should not have a connection to any of the other pins that this crosses. Yeah, we should be good. So I'm running this through here. So we now have to bend some pins on the gal up in a way that they don't touch the socket. So they don't make contact with the socket, but we are going to run some wires from those pins or to those pins. That's pins 7, 8, 9, 12 and 13. So that's three pins on this side. And two pins on the other side, I think. So if I'm not mistaken, this should be something like this. And I just bend the, the pins to be like horizontally level. So it's going to be easy to solder wires to these. I think I'm going to clip the, the actual pins and only leave the thicker part on there because it's easier to solder to that. I think I want to solder while this is in the socket already. You can, of course, you can do it in other ways, but I think it's easier to determine which length of wire we need for each connection this way. So that's what I'm going to do, I think. So this is going into our 20 pin socket here. And at this point we can also insert the RAM, I think. So this is supposed to go to pin 12, which is this pin. And that goes through a 33 ohms resistor. So I got myself a resistor and I think what I want to do is to shorten the legs of the resistor at this point. So adding some solder to pin 12, I think that's what we should do at this point. And then I'm going to add the little resistor there. I'm adding a piece of heat shrink tubing to the wire. And I really hope we have enough room for the standoff that goes through this hole, but I think so. Shrink the heat shrink. So in theory we should now have 33 ohms between uh, pin 1 this connection here, or a bit more even. Yep, 33.2, nice. So pin 13 on the gal has to be connected to pin six on the MMU, which we are also going to bend up. So count always starts from oh, top left pin, pin one, two, three, four, five, six. We need to bend upwards. So at this point, I'm going to insert this into the socket. This goes here. Okay, so pin 13 of this should just be connected to pin 6. I'm using the same wire here because I like it. And onto pin 6. So I'm going to use a piece of Kapton tape on this wire on the back side to hold it in place. Kapton tape is not really necessary. You could use electrical tape, but I found that Kapton tape for these purposes works really well. It's pretty sticky usually. So something like this. And this should be a bit more solid now so we don't rip out stuff in case it doesn't work. So the next step is going to connect pin 9 on the gal chip to pin 16 on the PIA, which is this chip here. So yeah, we are going to run a wire from here to pin 16. And this is a 40 pin chip, so pin 20, 18, uh, pin 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. I should add some solder to that and then run the wire. And I'm just going to solder to the top of the leg on the pin here. We don't have to bend that up or anything like that. And we're going to have to connect pin 8 on the gal to pin 17 on the PIA. I'm just using some of the resistors here and run the wire 
under the resistors. And that should go to pin 17, which should be the next pin on the PIA. I'm also going to add a 3.3 kilo ohms resistor between pins 16 and 20 on the PIA. Just going to put that on the back side here. Uh, that is something that's not mentioned in the forum post itself, but it is mentioned in the more in-depth German manual. So I'm just going to assume this is a good idea. I'm going to put some heat shrink tubing over that resistor, I think, to uh, insulate it from the lines on the board, although the solder mask should prevent it from shorting with anything, just as an added uh, layer of safety basically. Yeah, I think this is about how I want to place this and then put some heat shrink tubing over that. I also marked the pins on the board, which in my experience is always a good idea if you're soldering something that is not, or it's not totally clear at first glance where things go. And this should be between pin 16 and 5 volts. You could also use another spot where there's 5 volts, but I think pin 20 is 5 volts. It's going to be fine. There we go. Yeah, that should be all the connections we have to make. Uh, we got to populate the RAM and our little 74 LS95, and then we should be good to go. Pin 9 on the GAL is for switching the expansion RAM on and off. Uh, I'm going to leave that floating for now, which should uh, enable the RAM expansion. We're going to have a look at that. And then I'm probably going to end up soldering a switch on there, which switches this between ground and 5 volts. I'm just going to check it in this state, I think, and then make up my mind about the switch. Double checking the connections. Yep, time to populate the rest of the sockets. As I said, these 74 LS95 were the most difficult ones to find. I actually ordered some from, from Greece. <laughs> uh, yeah, they are still available from some eBay sellers and such. Probably a good idea to, if you have one, find some trusty seller. I'm not sure if these work, but we're going to see. And then our RAM goes in these sockets, obviously. This is just very standard NEC D412561010 RAM. So I got all my chips in. And potentially this could be a 320K Atari 65XE now. I'm just going to initially run a quick test run and see if this still displays the startup screen at all. Just in case we did something horribly wrong. <laughs> okay, so please cross your fingers that this still turns on at all. We're going to see. And indeed it does. Yay! We are going to see if the memory expansion works. So I have everything connected up. I also connected my SIO to SD to run software from. I have connected the keyboard back up and I'm using uh, the manual to insulate it, temporarily insulate it from the mainboard. So we are going to do some tests with the RAM expansion that hopefully should work. So we should be able to start the Draco sysinfo and at least the the overall system seems to still work fine. That's a, that's a good start. There we are, sysinfo. This is uh, has all kinds of information as its uh, name suggests about the system and also looks pretty nice. So a uh, system summary should show us the total amount of RAM and as you can see 
We have 62 kilobytes of conventional RAM and 265 kilobytes of expansion or 130XE banked RAM. Total gives us 318 kilobytes. So that's the value I expected actually. That's pretty nice. So our 320 kilobytes Atari seems to be alive. So this is the extended RAM test by Satantronic. Uh, I'm going to link everything in the video description in case you want to try these programs. I'm going with A all. Oh, and it's testing. 16 banks, 265 kilobytes. Okay. Okay, so this should be a pretty in-depth RAM testing. Oh, it shows me ease. Okay, that's not good. Oh, we can test individual positions here, I think. Test, okay. That gives me an error. That's testing. That gives me an okay now. This might be because of the floating pin there. That's not a good idea, probably. Yeah, it tests on second test, it tests okay. The positions where we had errors, actually. So that's a sign for uh, like an intermittent fault that probably might be caused by our pin on the gal just left floating there. Yeah, now it seems to test okay on uh, manually selecting these spots that showed me errors. So I suppose that uh, this should be good. We just have to add a switch or permanently link the pin to ground or to five volts. So I just temporarily put this into the bottom casing again. There's a couple of good spots where we could potentially add a switch on the outside of the case. Not sure if I want that because I'm usually not a huge fan of drilling into these cases. Hmm, I'm considering adding a switch, maybe something like here next to the RF modulator. Drilling one hole here doesn't really hurt the overall looks of this. Probably going to end up drilling a hole, which is not the best option, admittedly. But I think in this case, literally in this case, because it's pretty beaten up, <coughs> I, I think I just I just want to do that to have this uh, RAM expansion be switchable. Probably there's a lot of people screaming at me at the moment. <laughs> okay, I think I pretty much decided to drill a hole into this case, in this spot here. It shouldn't interfere with uh, anything too much. And as you can see, yeah, this case is already pretty much, uh, it's very yellowed and it's really dirty and uh, I guess it's not the most beautiful Atari XE case out there and it's mine. So I decided to do this. Feel free to not do this. As I said, you can wire this up, uh, just hardwire this up to be permanently active if you want, which shouldn't really be much of an issue. I think I still want the switch there. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to put one of these here. I, I know, I know, but yeah, it's mine, as I said, I decide. So six millimeter hole should be enough. And indeed it fits perfectly. And it also should fit right next to the RF modulator there. It's not too bad, I think. <laughs> and especially since this is kind of an old school mod and uh, people used to do this kind of thing all the time back in the day. So it's a very old school way kind of a nod to the good old times, I guess. So we're going to wire this up. Uh, one side goes to five volts. I've already determined that there's five volts on this resistor here. And the other side is going to ground through a 1K uh, resistor on this point here. There's, 
yeah, this is just connected directly to ground and I'm soldering to the ends of resistors because that's going to make things a bit easier. And the center pin is going to pin 9 on our gal, which is the pin that determines uh, whether our memory expansion is going to be used or not. And this gal should just uh, be passive in case we disable that and this should behave like a completely stock uh, Atari 65XE. And there we go. This should be a switchable RAM expansion now. As I said, I connected to this resistor here, which is directly hooked up to the shielding, so that's ground clearly. I measured 5 volts on this, this side of this resistor over here, and I connected the center pin of the switch to uh, pin 9 on the gal. So let's test this. I have hooked up my keyboard in the same way I did previously. And we should have our extended RAM test again. That's uh, showing me 16 banks at 256 kilobytes at this point. Let's test all and see if we get a proper result this time. Uh, this is now with the switch in the uh, grounded position. And actually this extended RAM test only shows me the extended memory. Oh, we got errors there. Okay. That's weird. But a lot, a lot less errors than previously. <laughs> uh, I don't know what this is doing. Maybe some of my RAM chips are a bit marginal. This seems to be faulty. Okay, maybe some of my memory chips are not working correctly. So uh, we should be able to switch this off now by switching the switch to the other position. And now it tells me that I have zero kilobytes of extra RAM, which is expected behavior. No XRAM detected. Yeah, this is our 62 kilobyte version. Sorry, my upscaler is having troubles with this resolution, I guess. <laughs> okay, and with the switch in the other position, it actually reports 318 kilobytes as before, so that's good. Yeah, so despite our bad readings in the extended memory test, I went on and downloaded some uh, demos and games that are supposed to only work with uh, 320k or uh, 256k. And uh, unfortunately, most of it doesn't work, as you can see here. Uh, this is supposed to be a demo, and uh, it has an, a built-in RAM test, and it, uh, my memory reads as bad. So uh, I went in and checked, rechecked all of the connections with my multimeter, and uh, the connections seem to be as intended. Uh, I resoldered some of the joints even, and uh, I suppose my RAM or some of my RAM chips are bad. Uh, there is some stuff that somewhat works at least, uh, which is kind of cool, but we don't really get anywhere with this because I don't have uh, replacement RAM chips. Some stuff just kind of works, like uh, this bomb jack port, which uh, requires 320k. It displays the startup picture, but then it doesn't go on, it just hangs. The extra RAM is detected. Uh, it shows me uh, 256k of extended RAM, which is what we put in here. But I think either some of my RAM chips are damaged or all the RAM chips are not really compatible with the timings. So my theory is that these RAM chips may not be fully compatible. These are pretty fast. The last two digits in the part number there, these are D41256C minus 10. And the 10 is the access time, basically. Usually for this time period, you would use uh, something that is a tiny bit uh, less 
quick. <laughs> so you, you would use something that has a 15 as the last two digits. But I had this 10 which worked in my... I, I bought these originally for my Commodore 64 uh, RAM expansion unit upgrade and they worked fine in that. I tested all of these in my uh, recently built DRAM tester and they're all showing as good, but uh, as I said in that video, it's not very accurate if it reads good, they might still have some bad bits in there. And I think I have some bad bits in one of these chips somewhere. But in theory, otherwise this seems to be uh, the way this is supposed to be wired up. As I said, it somewhat works. It just crashes uh, and gives me some like RAM errors, really. So I'm going to do some more troubleshooting, but I think I want to, if I, if I ever don't find a quick solution, I'm going to put up another uh, troubleshooting video about this. As I said, I'm, I'm also going to do some refurbishments on the case. And I think, uh, this is going to become a two-part video, unfortunately. Fortunately enough, I socketed all these RAM chips, so it's going to be pretty easy to try different ones once I have them. As I said, I don't have any more extra RAM chips in stock. So I'm pretty much uh, stuck with this <laughs> at this point, and I kind of want to get the video out of the door. So yeah, bear with me while I continue to troubleshoot this in one of the next videos. Some stuff kind of works. Uh, I'm going to show you a demo that kind of works. Just to kind of prove that this somewhat works and at least some of the memory seems to be accessible to the system. Yeah, and as you can see, there are some, some frames seem to be missing. There's like this garbage between there. I don't think this is supposed to look like this. Uh, yeah, as I said, I suspect we have some damage or uh, marginal RAM chips there, or the timings are just not compatible. But uh, my money is on one or two bad RAM chips in there. This somewhat works, and this is a demo that requires the 320K to completely run. So I suppose we did the wiring correctly, but I have bad RAM chips. I'm sorry about that. I know how unsatisfying this stuff is, and trust me, I am as unsatisfied as you, if not more. This is a huge bummer, unfortunately, but yeah, I can't, as I said, I don't have any replacement RAM left. I guess we just all have to live with this outcome for now, at least. Uh, as I said, I'm going to make a follow-up video where I go deeper into troubleshooting this. I guess this video is long enough already. As you can see, some stuff kind of works, but uh, this is too flaky to be considered a successful mod. So I'm going to do a follow-up video. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for supporting me on Patreon or on the channel memberships page on YouTube or on Ko-fi with single donations or with your hardware donations. And also thank you for sticking around this long and watching this video and watching my other videos for subscribing for your thumbs up or down or whatever you want to do with uh, these videos. Hope to see you again on this channel sometime. Feel free to comment if you have any ideas what could be wrong with this or if you know RAM chips that are compatible with this kind of mod. Thanks for watching. I'm Jan Beta. See you next time. Bye.